G'day everyone. How you doing? Welcome to Lubrication Experts. I am Rafe and today back by popular demand is Mr. Lake Speed Jr. Now, not only is our guest today back by popular demand, but this particular topic is one that had been probably the most requested out of any um, actually on my site. So I think there's a lot of people who will be particularly interested in this topic. And what we're talking about is racing oils. So we've already done a little bit of an introduction to this one. Uh, we had, I think it was episode 13, where we talked about um, uh, the oil analysis and, and oil development programs in the context of race teams. So uh, Tomic Young from ExxonMobil kind of talked us through that process in particular with regards to NASCAR and Red Bull Formula One program. Now today, what we're going to talk through is um, a little bit more about what distinguishes a race oil versus, you know, a standard petrol or diesel engine oil that you can pick up off the shelf. So what makes them different from the consumer grades? You know, what goes into them? You know, you know what are the kind of use cases and things like that? So very excited. But first, he sort of needs no introduction because he's already been on the podcast, but uh, I'll introduce Mr. Lake Speed Jr. Thanks for coming on. Oh, man. I, Rafe, I'm so excited about this one. Um, one, I love the podcast, you know, we were just talking a minute ago, uh, the recent one with Martin Greaves from, from Dow, I um, mean, the OSP base oils, that's some cool stuff. I mean, it actually has been used in some racing stuff. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Uh, and of course, you know, Jim Carrey from Exxon Mobil, when he was talking about, uh, the alkylated naphthalenes, I mean, Exxon Mobil uses those in their racing oil. So like you said, this will tie in really well. So several of your previous episodes, you know, especially going back to, like you said, the oil analysis and how they're doing that at the racetrack to support those teams. But that's all about knowing what the oil is doing in the engine, in the gearbox, in the environment. But as formulators, let's talk about what tools we have, what levers we can pull in order to reduce the wear and extend the performance of uh, those transmissions or gearboxes or, or engines in, in those applications, that's the really fun stuff. So, yeah, awesome, awesome. So, I mean, just to sort of set the table a little bit, if we can mm -hmm. talk about some of the basics. So, with um, one of the things that distinguishes a lot of the racing oils, whether they're commercially available or you know available in a team's environment, is the fact that they don't really tend to carry many approvals, right? <laughs> so they're uh, none, be, you know, non API. <laughs> Non OEM yeah. approved. Um, so, can we talk a little bit about that, and then extend that to what are some of the formulation differences that you might see in a racing oil, right? Whether that be, you know, different base oils that are used, or different additives, or or quantity of additives and things like that. Sure, sure. So, I think we should probably begin with a story that I live that I think also kind of helped set the stage for this. So. Obviously, everybody in our profession, you know, recognizes, you know, there's four big additive companies, you know, Lubrizol, Athen, Ornite, and Finium. So back in 1999 at Joe Gibbs Racing, because that's kind of my origin story is that I worked for Joe Gibbs Racing and was part of the oil development team. So my job for uh, 13 years was in charge of the oil program for Joe Gibbs Racing. Obviously, we did sell that to other people, but you know, one of my responsibilities was making sure that our cars ran the best they could. And that was the most fun part, by the way. Uh, you know, um, but how we got to be where we had our own oil program was that in 1999, 2000, we were actually having problems using off the shelf API rated oils that we could never find from an off the shelf product, given the current API standards at the time, a product that could give you really great horsepower and performance, but also had the durability to finish a 500 mile race. And that's where we found out about Lubrizol. And we entered into a partnership with Lubrizol where we did the testing, but they did the formulating. So they were developing bespoke formulas for us to use in the racing environment. 
And the first thing they did for us, the biggest problem we had was back at that time, we had, you know, flat tap bit camshaft. Remember a NASCAR engine, even the day, but back then was a V8. So it was a push rod engine. So you had overhead valves, but the camshafts in the block. So you've got all these, uh, this weight in the valve train that would require higher spring loads to control all of that mass at 9,000 or 10,000 RPM. Cause you know, consequently that was what was happening during that time frame. We were turning more RPM. We were increasing valve spring loads. So that's increasing the dynamic forces in the valve train. And what happened was we just exceeded the ability of those off the shelf, you know, API passenger car type oils. Because those oils were rated with about 215 pounds open valve spring pressure. So that back then the 3G uh, valve train wear test was flat tapping. But the maximum valve spring pressure was 215 pounds. We had uh, race engines that had more than 215 pounds on the seat. You know, 600, 700 pound open valve spring pressure. So the oils just couldn't do it based on the chemistry at the time. But then as we began to reduce the level of ZDP in the oils for catalytic converter poisoning protection, right? Uh, which is a good thing. No other wrong with that. As that began to happen and we pushed for longer drain intervals, what happened was you had a reduction in ZDP, valve train and eye wear protection. You had an increase in detergency, which competes against the valve train wear. That was the tipping point for us because we had higher valve spring pressures. We saw it before many other people in the industry did. And that's what led to having the necessity for a break in oil. So to get to the chemistry part, well, what made break-in oil work? Well, the reality was very low detergent. We're talking 300 parts per million calcium, no magnesium, no sodium. Yet we had 2,500 parts per million secondary ZDP, short chain secondary ZDP. So it also very low level of dispersant. So we know that dispersants uh, in, inhibit and hinder ZDP film formation. So type of ZDP matters, how quickly that ZDP film forms. So we needed a very thick, robust ZDP film to break in the engines properly. So the first thing we had was this high ZDP, low detergent, low dispersant formulation that could easily build that anti-wear film when we needed it during that critical break-in process, because no one cared how much power the engine made on the dyno with braking oil in it. What we cared about was the racetrack. But we were able to break in the engine and establish that anti-wear film throughout the engine during the break-in process. Then we could go to a more highly friction-modified oil with lower levels of ZDP for the race. You can go from a mineral-based oil during break-in, not because mineral was anything special it's just that why i spend the extra cost when it doesn't really do anything for you and, and you may be able to make the argument and i think in some applications some extreme applications uh the the higher sulfur level inherent in like a group one base stock could be beneficial the pressure viscosity coefficient of a group one base oil could be beneficial in some extreme load application for break-in so we just went with that group one mineral oil and it got the job done. But then you would switch to a, a synthetic. We use the PAO ester blend for that. ZDP level comes down, down, down to around well, where we raced for the longest time was right around 800 to 1,000 parts per million. As the temperatures and loads crept up, the ZDP level had to kind of creep up with it a little bit to keep pace with what was going on. But we also brought in a lot of molly. So I would say the one additive that is probably the largest difference, if you look at an API oil versus a real race oil, the one additive that's going to jump off the page at you on an oil analysis sheet is going to be molybdenum. Uh, we're typically running anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 parts per million molybdenum uh, in a pure racing oil. 
And obviously, you know, that you'd be lucky, lucky to find 150 parts per million uh, in an API oil. Yeah, right. So you've already already spoken about in some ways some of the trade-offs that you have to make, right? So this mm -hmm. is this idea. Um, I know when I was back at mobile, they used to call it the, the idea of the balanced formulation. It was really this idea that there's always trade-offs between different things. Right? Absolutely. So so one of the trade-offs that you just described was the trade-off between detergency right, and the mm -hmm. capacity to build anti-wear films. So this idea that you can have a certain amount of calcium and a certain amount of zinc, and maybe those two things don't necessarily go together. So could you maybe, please maybe describe in a little bit more detail what kind of... Um, let's say, additive competition you're talking about? So obviously, ZDP is polar. So it has to react under temperature and load to create that phosphate glass film that we all talk about that provides that very thick, robust, and I wear film. So the detergents are also polar, especially calcium-based uh, detergents are very polar. Um, so what was happening and we'll call it the mid 2000s with API SM is you had, you know, calcium tended to, to be, do pretty good in terms of it. So they lower friction, right? That's one of the big things between calcium and magnesium is that uh, magnesium tends to be a really great detergent in terms of it's got really great uh, acid neutralization ability, right? So it really can give you a lot of TBN for a small dose, but it tends to be kind of poor on friction. So in that mid-2000 era, what you saw was a lot of the additive package uh, went towards very high level of calcium because that calcium was a lower friction. So it would give you fuel economy. That's great. The problem was that, that was super high level of the calcium. It was, there was so much competition at the surface level between the detergent and the ZDP that you had very splotchy ZDP film, which... Lower valve spring pressures, lower loads, eh, not a big problem. Higher pressures, higher loads, no problem. And that's where this stuff came around. It, it, interesting. Uh, I don't know if you've touched on it in your oh, in somewhere recently. If I missed it, I'm I'm sorry. Um, I, I see these people talking about SP oils and how the new SP and the Dexos Gen Two or the Gen Three oils have you know lower calcium. They're lower TBN, and let's just say, right, I can hear the people looking down their nose at it like yes, somehow another is not good. Reality is it's better. I'm, I, I, when we first started testing some of the SN Plus oil, we did a lot of valve train testing. We we're taking flat tappet engines, and we're measuring all 16 lobes on non-phosphated cans, right? Because back in the day, the 3G test, used a cam that had a break-in coating on the camshaft. Uh, okay, well, that's kind of masked what the oil does. So we, we work with competition cams in, here in the U.S. and made special cams for our, our own version. We'll call it a racing 3G, essentially. No break-in coating. Hmm. So you were, the oil was the only thing that was going to do the job. That way you could really see what those chemistry differences was. So, of course, like any good test, you have to have reference oils. When you get a new batch of cams, you got to run the known good reference and the known bad reference. Well, you go, well, the known bad reference was an off-the-shelf oil. <laughs> well, all of a sudden we go and we run our known bad reference oil. And it's like, this is like way better than it's been. It's like, you guys ground the camshafts wrong. It went from SN to SN+. Plus. When you look at the used oil from that test, the difference was the ZDP was the same. The detergent package had changed. So then we went on a little mission, right? We're going to go grab a bunch of the other known bad oils we ran in the past. We're going to run them again. They all ran good. Yeah. Like better than before. What was the difference? When we went to SN plus and SP, we changed that balance. So from a wear protection standpoint, we've seen an increase in wear protection via the decrease in calcium, the elimination of sodium, because uh, obviously sodium is really bad for low speed pre-ignition, high level of calcium, 
really bad for low speed pre-ignition. So that's a positive change. And I, T, TBN to me is something that is a, uh, a dinosaur. It's a relic from the past that was for high sulfur fuels. And I know there are some places in the world that it's still high, high sulfur fuels. So I'll put a big asterisk on my statement there uh, that if you have high sulfur fuels, it is something you need to watch. But if you're you know, in Australia, if you're in North America, you don't have high sulfur fuels, uh, don't worry about TBN. That's not what you need to, to be focused on. You know, in fact, you know, these, these race oils, because of that super low detergent level, I mean, we would have oils that if you looked at the, the total base number brand new, it'd be like 1.7, <laughs> you know, two out of the bottle, you yeah. know, with an acid level almost the same. A lot of times when you had very high spring loads, you you actually needed true EP additives. So you had to have some active sulfur in the oil. So when you were formulating that oil, and that's one thing we did, uh, um, you know, obviously working with Lubrizol, we didn't have to start with an additive package. We weren't starting with a PCMO and then, you know, down treating it, adding stuff to it. We always, from day one, component formulated every oil. We never used a DI package. Mm. We made the oils component by component. So, you know, a normal race oil blend may have 14 or 15 different components in it, in, including, you know, all the base oils and co-base stocks and, and stuff. But to me, that's what gave us a really great insight uh, into how oils work. I mean, I think that's one really great thing about race oils is that it can teach you a lot about how the oil is going to respond in extreme environments. And while that chemistry exact profile will never work in a passenger car application, there are lessons you can learn from that and apply it in other areas uh, because you begin to understand the trade-offs, like you were mentioning, you know, between the basals. I think back to Jim Carrey when he was talking about the alkylated naphthalenes. That is the big deal is that when you're running you know, a PAO base oil, it doesn't have enough solvency by itself to hold a robust additive package. When you, especially if it's component blend, uh, if you got a lot of stuff in there, it doesn't want to stay. So you're going to have to put in some kind of co-base stock to make it happen. Well, the polarity of that co-base stock is now this other thing Interfering with well, how does that DDP form on that uh, part compared to the detergent? So that's one thing I know that they really liked about the alkylated naphthalenes is that it was a natural antioxidant and it had lower polarity. But it would maybe have a lubricity benefit to it that, say, maybe a TMP ester would give you. So there's that's, there's trade-offs, right? It's just... There's always trade-offs. There's no magic bullet. So it's, I, that's why I think about doing the race all stuff. Gives you a really good way. Wow, trade-offs are because those race engines, they will make you pay. They will tell you when they're unhappy, and you will know really quickly. You don't have to wait hundreds of thousand miles. <laughs> They'll tell you in a hundred or so. Yeah, I mean that's that, that's really interesting. And 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 one thing I wouldn't mind maybe clearing up because I feel like the the racing oil community if you like is very much a community partly made up of professionals but also some very uh, strongly opinionated enthusiasts let's put it that way right? so yeah, yeah, i think so you should be, be a politician yeah <laughs> that was well worded yeah yeah i think i think we it would be helpful to talk through um you know some of the myths that are out there when it comes to racing oils like one of the things that you pointed out is high levels of zddp right that we mm -hmm. typically see in a racing oil Compared to in the commercially available, you know, SP kind of categories where we're restricted on how much zinc we can use because of right. the use of catalytic converters. Now, sure. the other thing I would say is that in the racing oil community, 
there was maybe this dictum that more zinc is better, right? Right. And the more that I use, and, and you see this used and, and leveraged by marketing divisions of, of certain old companies that will say, oh, you know, we have 2,000, 2,500 parts per million zinc or whatever. Right. Now, from a chemistry standpoint, my understanding is there is such thing as too much of a good thing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But can you help us understand what's the mechanics of that? What what do we actually mean by too much zinc? Uh, what the effects are? And and where do we typically see that? I think I've seen some published works around sort of that beyond 13 to 1400 parts per million zinc is when you start to run into trouble, but but you would know much better than I would. That's a great uh, lead up there because I agree. The level of ZDP is often used as a marketing tool with the idea that more is better and it becomes this arms race of who has more. And, but from the chemistry, the mechanics of it, there is so much, there, there is too much of a good thing and can cause problems. So if, if we thought about like a little graph here uh, with where on the vertical axis, and ZDP level on the horizontal axis. So if we go over here and we have very low ZDP, like zero ZDP, for a given speed, load, and viscosity, you're gonna have very high wear. As we begin to add ZDP, wear is gonna begin to come down because now the ZDP is able to start building a film, a more complete film that can protect that part. Now you gotta remember ZDP is a sacrificial film. So it's reacting with the metal, the metal surface. But it is building this film that's sloughing away because it's softer. So as those parts are rubbing together, it's sloughing away and then rebuilding. But as that ZDP level begins to increase, keep going this way, now my wear really starts to increase again because I can be building such a thick film that I'm sloughing off more metal. And it, is, it does contain phosphorus, contains sulfur. It's reacting in there. So at a high enough level, it actually becomes acidic. And it's corrosive wear. So if you think about that our, our chart here, the far left here with a very low ZDP, you actually basically have you know, abrasion going on, right? You have adhesion and abrasion going on that's the form of wear you have. On this side, where it's high again, is corrosive wear. And in fact, not to give away too many secrets here, one of the ideas of break-in oil for the race application was that we needed to have those parts wear in quickly. So we used you know, 2,500, 3,000 parts per million ZDP in order to actually chemically wear in the engine in a shorter amount of time. Because we need to go to synthetic oil quickly. We have a limited amount of time we're going to run this engine, and we need the engine to be at its maximum potential. We need the rings of seat, we need the camshafts, and all the parts to be mated in with a protective film. So we're actually going to push that chemistry toward the edge here we're not getting the lowest possible wear. So what would that do? That would delay the end time. But if you go to the other side, not enough ZDP, we risk parts failure. We risk scuffing, scoring, galling. So the corrosion where we can live with that because we're controlling that versus the roll of the dice. You know, the old days, right? These guys used to use straight 30 non-detergent oil. They'd run the engine for 20 minutes and they'd dump it out. They were rolling the dice, right? Letting it wear in. Maybe whatever residual, there may be a little bit of ZDP in the old wheels. Probably back in the day, they were group one. So there was some sulfur in there. So they probably weren't risking it too bad. Of course, we know today, most um, non detergent oils contain nothing. You know, they're group two, they're very low sulfur. So <laughs> it's something you should not use in any engine at, anymore. So we were playing that game. So, but once you've, run in the engine now we would back that up and i, I agree that from a thousand ppm to maybe around 1400 1500 ppm is a good safe zone to be in 
of course, the big trick there is it, it doesn't act in a vacuum. It's not acting by itself. So when you add in molybdenum, it's going to act as a synergist with the ZDDP. Um, so a lot of times you can have a lower level of ZDP and get better protection and lower friction. Add in, uh, we'll call it an equal amount of molybdenum. Now the downside of that is you're going to build more deposits long term, um, which is why you don't see passenger car oils at 200 ppm. Well, even if they didn't have a lower limit on ZDP, right? We know there's a 600 uh, minimum. If, they, if there was no minimum, you still probably wouldn't see a 300 ppm ZDP oil with a 300 ppm molly because it wouldn't pass um, any of the deposit tests. Because that's the downside to Molly is it tends to be pretty bad for deposits. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Uh, one of the other big questions I think that everyone encounters when they're using bracing oils is the question as well of um, viscosity selection, right? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, because everything's non-standardized, there is no recommendation that's coming from an OEM, right? It's not like no. the OEM is telling you in the case of a diesel engine, you have to use a 15W40 or or you know, a petrol engine, maybe it's a 0W20 or something like that. And so you've got a whole bunch of different, um, let's say, needles that we can move up and down, which mm -hmm. could dictate the, visco the viscosity that I go to, right? So a an example would be um, various types of surface finish, which we talked about last time right. Right, on, the, on the inside of, uh, of the liners. Um, it might be the temperature that you run out. It could be, um, you know, ambient temperatures. It could it could be any any number of factors which go into it. So, for let's say the enthusiast, right, or or even yeah. you know race teams that are sort of building these these engines from the ground up with non standardized parts, they might even be doing a little bit of manufacturing themselves. How, how do you go about selecting a, a viscosity? Because again, when it goes back to myths that are sort of in the racing oil community i've seen a lot of people say got to use 20w60 right it's got to, i've got to use the heaviest <laughs> thing possible yeah, yeah. to protect oh, yeah. my engine otherwise my engine is going to be junk without realizing that you can go too thick right <laughs> there is Absolutely. there is such a thing right too thick. yeah and, and so could you maybe talk through what's the decision process but also what are sort of like the up and downsides um, of going too high and too low Oddly enough, that I'm here today in Lake Havasu City, Arizona at EFI University with the dino cell right behind me. Uh, I've done, God, I don't know how many hours of testing oils here in this dino cell with, with Ben Strader and, and his group here, which are excellent people, by the way. Um, couldn't endorse them enough. The number one thing we do when we're dynoing anything here is we measure well temperature. So I'm gonna give you a couple, three different applications here, and they're pretty common racing applications. And then we're gonna walk back through the actual cinestope flow rate of these, and it's gonna be, should be pretty revealing if you haven't thought about it in the past. So a pro stock the drag race car. So that's, you know, car that looks somewhat like a street car, but it's all tricked out, right? Um, car gets pushed up to the starting line in drag racing and they run a zero w5 oil for example and that car runs for six and a half seconds down the racetrack 200 miles an hour okay compare that that by like a 500 cubic inch engine that makes 1500 horsepower almost uh at 10,500 rpm now you look at say a nascar engine or uh australian v8 supercar engine that's you know 358 cubic inches making 600 700 horsepower running uh, about 9,000 rpm and those guys are going to run somewhere by around five that'd be 20 sometimes that are well than that well, let's just call it you know uh, 520 you know those things are going to run probably 240 or so degrees oil temperature that's well in well that's way out of then you look at, say, uh, a sprint car. So methanol-injected 
410 cubic inches and wing sprint car. These things have got grunt racing on dirt. And those guys run 15W50. But they only run eight quarts of oil. Or, you know, less than that. They run about uh, seven quarts of oil. No oil cooler. So the end of a 50 lap A main, those things are running 300 degrees oil temperature. Easy. So just from a glance, you're like, oh, okay. Sprint car guys, methanol, all that. They're running the thickest oil. Let's think about this, though. What's the flow rate? What's the operating viscosity of these three oils? Well, that 1550, 300 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 150 C Celsius, is going to be somewhere around six or seven centistoes, depending upon uh, the base oil viscosity blend. That NASCAR oil that's 020 is going to be about the same. That pro stock oil, that 0W5, it would appear to be the thinnest. 12 to 13 centistokes. So it's almost double operating viscosity of the other two. So the first thing you have to get out of your head when you're talking about a racing engine are SAE viscosity grades. If you don't know your operating oil temperature, you know nothing. You have to know that first because the goal of racing is be as efficient as possible. On this dyno, we go from a non friction modified 5W30, fully friction modified, semi synthetic 15W40, and lost 22 horsepower. Now, at Degree C, 30 centistokes. The 15W40 was 14 centistokes. Talking a four centistoke difference under degree C at 212 Fahrenheit. Not a giant difference. You, you shouldn't see two horsepower from four centistokes. That, that, that doesn't work that way. Four centistokes? worth a couple but going from a non-friction modified oil to a friction modified oil is also it should have been about a wash did that test the oil temperature was about 105 degrees Fahrenheit so it was right at 40 degrees C well the difference between those two was that 5W30 was about 40 something centistokes at um 40C. The other one was 70. So we were 30 centistokes different where the horsepower came from or went to uh, was that. So that's why it's so important to begin with the application. I, my re, wrote answer to everything racing oil is application dictates. Just because this racing does not mean the chemistry is universal. Kind of racing you're doing. What's the operating temperature of the engine? What kind of fuel running? Because the amount of fuel dilution you're going to get in the engine is going to have a direct impact on what viscosity choice I need to make. So if I don't know the details of the application, it's impossible for me to actually formulate an oil that's going to give you maximum efficiency and protection. Yeah, that's that is a... Uh, I would say fantastic and very comprehensive answer, actually, um, to all of. It's the... no different than what you what, than what the guys do to formulate a diesel oil or a passenger car motor oil. They they know the application, they know the details first, right? If you're developing the PCMO today, what are you looking at? You're looking at all, all the yeah. ASTM test methods. You know what engine you got to run. You know where you got to be. You know what fuel you're going to be dealing with and all that. So you're going to begin to develop that formulation based off what you know you have to pass. If they change the engine, then you change that. Racing is no different. Yeah, that's really interesting. So maybe one of the areas that we haven't really touched on so much would be um, how does um, elements of what goes into the oil affect horsepower? Now, we talked about it a little bit in the context of viscosity, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, but obviously there's some other areas where we can kind of give our engine a little bit of help. Um, yes. Whether it's in regards to friction modification or even the type of base oils that we use. So we've already talked about the fact that you can have too much ZDDP, which can cause um, you know excess friction in, mm -hmm. in the engine. Um, we haven't really talked about the different types of base oils that we might use or friction modifiers that we might use. Right, and right, how right. How that would affect horsepower. So could you maybe just give us a quick rundown, please? Sure. So base oil selection is typically going to be predicated on temperature. So back to an HRA pro stock, you know, very low temperature operation environment. I'm going to be using a really light base oil and because I want the maximum horsepower because I'm only running for a very short amount of time. I'm not worried about viscosity index all that much because I'm operating essentially the, the temperature doesn't really change, you know? Um, so I don't worry about viscosity index. I need something that can flow really well. And I want something that has a very low traction coefficient, very low internal uh, friction. So that's where you would typically end up with something like a PAO2, PAO2 and a half. Those are pretty typical base oils to be used in the really low like that. So that's, very, that's the great thing about PAOs. Uh, very low coefficient of friction. Very low pore point, which means they can be really thin at low temperature. So you tend to be uh, low viscosity PAO. Uh, but then you're going to go in. Now it gets fun is you begin to choose your co-base stocks. And you say, I need something to provide solubility to be able to dump in all of my other additives that I have to have to do all the other work they got to do. Now I can begin to pick, you know, what type of co-base stock. Is it going to be an alkylated naphthalene that maybe provides maybe less um, lubricity, less competition, against another friction modifier that I have, you know, that way it can do its job better. Right? That, that's one way of uh, formulating the world. The other way may be that, you know, I want to use a co-based dog, maybe say, for example, a, a, a TMP type ester that's got a lot of lubricity to it, right? It's got all these different uh, chains on it. And so it's going to have a lot of really great lubricity. So then, oh, okay, well then I'm going to use that because it's going to basically be benefiting my blend and then everything else is about wear protection and then you can get into some of that crazy osp stuff where you maybe blend in a couple of different things and you create this weird cocktail <laughs> of chemistries because um you know back to what martin was talking about where and i think you even mentioned it really really great is that so like on a TMP, you know, you've got this cord and you've got these branches and you've got stuff and it's really spatial, right? The OSPs, you know, the, the PEG or the PAG esters essentially, they're flat. And you got these oxygen basically going to hold down. So it will lay flat on the surface. So they're really surface competitive lay this thing flat down one of the interesting things i found about them um because they're really cool is that at a high treat rate you tend to see higher friction because they will also stack on each other right and they, they all want to hang together so it kind of create this bulky friction at the surface but then uh, you use them at a very low treat rate a lot of benefit. I mean, I, I literally found it by accident uh, because when you're doing uh, friction modifier testing, you have to do flushing with non-friction modified high detergent oils in between each oil you're testing to remove all the friction modifiers from it. So when you have that, you know you got, that oil needs to go back to its reference baseline number, right? If I've got my flush oil that power level needs to go back to where the flush oil began. Otherwise, we got to investigate. And I noticed that whenever we ran a, we'll call it 
an OSP substituted blend, right? So it's not, these aren't, this isn't, isn't anything proprietary I'm about to say. It's like pretty common. If you're using a PAO, you're going to use an ester as potentially a code based stock. It's probably going to treat somewhere in the 8 to 10% range by weight. That, that's, I mean, there's a bajillion SAE papers and there's patents that you can find online. It's like not, not secret, right? So if you're going to go look at, say, a PAG, and you're like, well, okay, well, I'm going to substitute it for an ester. You put it in at eight different percent. Like, oh, I really didn't do anything. Well, then you got to run your flush oil. And your flush oil gains power. My flush oil just outrun my race oil. It's messed up here. It's broken. Then you finally figure it out. It's the treat rate. You got to bring the treat rate down. But then because of their chain link and everything, they also will act different at different temperature thresholds. So back to knowing the application, there are some friction modifiers that work really good temperature, which is, if you think about the additives are typically in a PCMO that can give you good fuel economy benefit during the FTP drive cycle. What you're looking at is, I mean, I need as much friction reduction as I can when that oil is thick, right? Because I'm paying a big penalty for viscosity there. But as the engine warms up and you do the highway cycle, well, the engine at a higher speed, there, there's, it's harder to affect the uh, fuel economy in the highway side of the FTP. Friction modifiers tend to do, do more work in the, uh, the warm up, you know, cold cycle part of the FTP. So that's where, from how I formulate the oil, if I know that I'm going to be running at low temperature, then I'm going to tend to go towards friction modifiers that are going to be more active at low temperature and that will give me more benefit. But then if I'm going to be doing the endurance racing engine, this is going to run at a higher temperature. I'm going to approach that differently because I want to find and the way you know that is you got to do dyno testing, right? There's there's nothing you can do in the lab. Eh, maybe an MTM might tell you a little bit. The only problem with an MTM is they typically don't, they can't replicate the speeds and the loads. No, they can replicate the load. They just can't replicate the speed that you actually see in a race engine. We were actually going to buy an MTM at one point at Gibbs, but then we actually calculated all the service speeds in the engine. They couldn't come close to it. No, we doesn't mean we couldn't have used it as a screening tool to get down, but because we were in a situation where at the end of the year we had so many spare engines that were the that year spec that you weren't going to use the next year, we used those engines to do full scale friction modifier testing. So we were in a situation where we had this resource that we could consume to get the benefit of having to spend money to buy a lab piece of equipment uh, to tell us that somebody could, we could find out another way. So we're that made us a unique situation. If you're not a race team that's building engines and you need to buy an MTM to be able to screen friction modifiers based on temperature to see which ones will actually work better in your application. I probably just said way too much. <laughs> no, that's, that's, I mean, that's really interesting. That That's actually really, really fascinating. Um, I mean, that kind of brings me to, to, to one question, which, you know, as we start to end these podcasts, we always like to give a bit of a look to the future. And you've already mentioned, say, for example, the use of OSPs and things like that. But is there anything, because you get to sort of play a little bit more at the margins with the racing oils, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to use standardized additive chemistries. You don't have to use standardized ad packs or anything like that. Is there anything kind of cool and novel that you've seen used in racing oils recently? Um, that are kind of out there technologies. Uh, and one of the reasons I ask this is because often stuff gets trialed in race engines and then eventually that's what, that's the kind of technology that makes its way into sort of the consumer style grades. So is there anything kind of novel that you've seen lately? Well, um, the thing that is out, it's still kind of new-ish to the industry um, is that, you know, at Gibbs, we were the very first team to ever use 
a metallocene PAO uh, mm-hmm. from Exxon or from Chevron Phillips. Uh, we used the MPAO 100 in Daytona in 2010. So before there was even commercially available supply of metallocene PAO, we were already using it to win races. Um, that was cool, right? That was where you see a new technology that's coming online. Oh, wait, that has some characteristics that I think could be beneficial to what we're doing in racing. You go to the dyno, you test it out. Yeah, it, that, that's that's a winner. Okay, right, let's have some of that. One that up and you, and you go racing. And then over time, that technology, like I said, makes its way in, into the the market. I think the biggest thing that I've seen is that, you know, if you look at some of these low viscosity, you know, like GF6B um, type oils, that those base oil, you can't see everything, right? But if you kind of look at what's going on, those base oil blends are looking closer and closer to what was a race oil, base oil, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, the because they're that's one thing about them, right? When you start getting into the zero twenties and the zero sixteens and it's the twelves and that stuff come come around, you're gonna be relying on a PAO to do that. And sometimes you can, with a commercial DI package, you can blend a PAO and a group three, and you can get enough solubility. To then, without a code base stock, bring in the added package and keep it stable. And then now you, and that's not a bad thing necessarily, right? Because now I have whatever my friction modifiers are, aren't having to compete against the ester. I don't have to necessarily worry about hydraulic stability, you know, with some applications. So there's, there's, there's trade offs in everything, but you can see, you know, that maybe higher levels of Molly now as, you know, and the, the boronated uh, additives in there and how that Molly and boron and ZDP can be synergistically together. I, those are the hints that I see when you look at a modern, you know, API SP or maybe even a GM Dexo spec type oil. I, I can see where the lessons learned in racing about how you bring in some of these uh, technologies together and Use synergy, right? It's really the synergies we learn to use in racing is what you're seeing applied uh, to the passenger car oil markets. Not necessarily the exact chemistries in the same ratio, is because obviously with in racing, engines aren't gonna live that long, so you're not having having to worry as much. But I, I think it's interesting. I mean, I would love to know what different. Uh, oil manufacturers are using for their um, viscosity modifiers. The the SBR, you know, style uh, VMs are my favorite. Uh, you know, the self-assembling polymers from the styrene butadine rubbers, they they were the best for power because they could have a very high RPM engine and they disassemble at high shear rates. So it flattens out the stride back curve at high surface velocities. But then they reassemble at lower surface velocities, so that, that that there's obviously fuel economy there. So I, I would imagine that some of these, uh, you know, GF6 um, type of wells, when you're really getting big fuel economy pushes, I can almost imagine those making their way in there. You know, and you and you see some oils today that, based on the price tag of those oils uh, from major blenders. Uh, kind of leads you down the path and you know they're doing something like that. Yeah. You know, and then I think interesting development, I believe, in the racing oil industry, uh, which will be something to see over the years because it's really new, is the development of the Dexos R. You know, so General Motors has a Dexos R rating, which is their race rating. And so now they have some oils that are meeting that Dexos R approval so there's never been a racing spec before but now a gm has one and it's for the corvettes uh i think the camaros that are they had the you know, track packages on them and with the oems now having so many track uh cars and packages available now 
that'll be an interesting development to think to see where that goes. What does that look like? Because those are a real, a real hybrid. Because those are cars that are driven to the racetrack. They're not typically going to be driven to the racetrack. So you have a whole different thing you got to deal with that. You can't be super low detergent. You, you, those still have to pass emissions. So how do you manage all that? To me, that's cool stuff. That's really fun because it's going to make you work harder. You just can't throw a bunch of ZDP at it and call it good. Yeah. That's uh, that's fascinating. I didn't even know about the Dexos aspect. So yeah, I mean, yeah. they're having to do that sort of trade off between what is going to go into, you know, a road legal car that is going to do a fair bit of track work. I think that that's an interesting compromise uh, for for the formulators to to have to make. Well, um, Mr. Speed, it has been fantastic once again to uh, to talk to you and get in depth knowledge. From someone who who works extensively in in this area, so really appreciate your time today. Um, for sure, I imagine that there's going to be some questions about this, so I'm sure we can get back. <laughs> oh, I would think for, so <laughs> for another round for sure. If, if, the, if the comment section below is crickets, then man, I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, re really appreciate your time, and we'll talk again soon.